Support for Clever comes from Thomas Avenue Ceramics. Thomas Avenue Ceramics provides beautiful, quality, and cost-effective tiles at the click of a button. Their Trade Professionals program was designed from the ground up to provide contractors and designers with the necessary tools to service their customers' needs. Deep product discounts, free shipping direct to clients, free samples, and product sourcing are just a few of the benefits you'll receive, along with a dedicated account representative who will be available to help you with any of your project needs. Visit thomasavenueceramics.com slash designers or thomasavenueceramics.com slash contractors and sign up today. They look forward to working with you. So I flew over and me, him, and then Chris Williams, who is the other original founding member of the principals, made this piece from basically 8 p.m. when their shop closed and their boss left until 6 a.m. the next morning. Boxed it up, I took it in a cab and then flew, like took it immediately to the airport and flew back with it and assembled it. And we knew immediately, we were like, we gotta do something together. Like this is such a great combination of all three of us. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie. I'm Amy and this is Clever. And today we're talking to Drew Seskinus. Drew is an architect and founding member of The Principles. The Principles are an experimental design studio balancing utility with a universal sense of wonder. They combine elements of architecture, industrial design, and clever fabrication techniques to create projects that expand the boundaries defining how we see and interact with the world. Drew was born in Baltimore and accidentally found himself studying architecture at University of Maryland after being transfixed by a Frank Lloyd Wright documentary. After earning his master's degree from Pratt, he moved to Europe and worked on architectural projects before returning to New York to found the principles in 2011. As you'll hear, his approach is both systematic and expansive. Let's talk to Drew. My name is Drew Siskunas. I live in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm an architect. I have a design studio called The Principles, and we do, I call it experimental architecture, but everything from product design to interactive installations to more traditional architecture as well. Let's go all the way back to the very beginning. I, we want to hear all about your childhood. Like, where were you born? What was your family dynamic like? What sort of lasting impressions were made on you in your youth? I was born in Baltimore, and the suburbs of Baltimore, actually. Both my parents are from the city. I have one older brother who's three years older than me. So he kind of shaped a lot of what my childhood and I think who I was kind of focused on being. We had a pretty, I guess, standard suburban middle-class upbringing. Both my parents are public servants. My mom's a librarian. And my dad was an administrator for the School of Medicine at the University of Maryland, where they did, so he, he did like schizophrenic research. And yeah, I mean, nobody really in my family was in design or architecture. My mother was an artist. She started as an art teacher. So I think maybe that's kind of where my interest in mm -hmm. these things came from. But yeah, I started probably, I think I was, I was thinking about when, when I kind of first realized that I was interested in this stuff and probably, I think when in kindergarten, we used to have these like scraps that people would bring in like egg cartons and stuff like that. And that was at the time when Ghostbusters was really big. So this is like 1985 or 86, I guess. And we used to all just make Ghostbusters proton packs like every day that was like we were just obsessed <laughs> with it and actually my Chaz my my old partner at the principals him and I were in kindergarten together so I think probably our first collaboration might have been <laughs> Ghostbusters proton packs for <laughs> Halloween that's awesome so what tell us more about your adolescence what about moving into high school were you you know really interested in, in taking art classes or science I was definitely very interested in art classes. I was very lucky to have like a series of, of art teachers throughout my life that had a huge impact on my 
my career development or my interest in art. At the same time, I was like, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm like such a cliche when it comes to being an architect. Like I was good at art and I was good at math. And that like logically seemed like a good combination to me to be an architect as if I knew what it really took. But (laughs) when I first decided, so I went to college in 1999 and around that time, PBS had just run this Maybe it was like a year before that they had run this really great documentary on Frank Lloyd Wright. And that was like, I saw that, I think maybe my junior year. And I kind of was like, what do I want to be when I grow up? And then I saw this and I was like, this is so logically like a combination of those things. But I didn't like kind of realize until later that I can't imagine how many architects were created or birthed from that PBS series because it was <laughs> oh wow like Frank Lloyd Wright's so cool and like everybody saw this and was like oh, I want to be that yeah that's that sounds good I was like a pretty did a lot of sports I did art as well and I also like skateboarded and surfing were a big part of my life growing up even though I kind of grew up in the mid Atlantic two or three hours from the beach but every summer we would go to the beach and my uncle was a lifeguard so he surfed when he was like younger and he got my brother and I into it and that was something that's like throughout my whole life been a constant and kind of been a good source of inspiration or just a way to develop methods of thinking or self-analysis I guess that's kind of always come out of it but a big motivator and a cultural thing to skateboarding and surfing were always I think as a kid a way of like orienting yourself because there's an aesthetic that's involved in that and aesthetic of like how you do it but also what clothes you wear and how you critique how other people do it and that always related to I think later on in my design career who who I kind of thought of who I was and how that all kind of came about. There's also I'm not a skateboarder or a surfer so I don't want to pretend like I'm coming from a position of authority but there seems to be also a very important relationship between you and something that's bigger than you in both skateboarding and surfing. I mean, in surfing, you're, you're in the ocean and you're working out the dynamics of how the waves roll in and how you, the timing of when you're going to catch it and the vastness of the ocean just beats you and pummels you and then sometimes lifts you up and carries you to shore. And then with skateboarding, it's, it's different. You're sort of navigating terra firma on your own set of wheels, but at the same time, things are coming at you fast and you've got to have this agility. There, there seems to me that people who have embraced skateboarding and surfing, there is a understanding of flow and motion. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely, yeah. There's, I think, to see the analysis of how someone does surfing or what what a good skater, skateboarder is or how to do a trick in a way that's aesthetically pleasing has everything mm-hmm. to do with flow and you know just what kind of clothes you're wearing when you do it, but how casual you look when you're doing it. You know, definitely in surfing, the more casual you look, and that's kind of always been the case. The more aesthetically pleasing people find it and i like that there's that critique i totally agree with you too that it's like it's about i think that this is definitely for me a big focus for design too when i think about why i do design or what was the purpose of the work that i created i kind of always come back to the point that it's a medium to try to correlate us as like one small entity within a much larger thing. So it gives us some kind of sense of scale of who we are in the context mm. of everything else. Cause we're always forgetting that with everything, you know, like our brains are kind of programmed for us to be the biggest thing that's all around us. And I think the more frequently we can be reminded that we're actually the smallest, most insignificant thing, the better we operate collectively. So design mm-hmm. is kind of like that medium. And like you were saying, like in reference to, you and the ocean or you and the urban landscape, you end up always looking at, like skateboarders and surfers are like analyzers. You know, if you're Mm -hmm. a surfer, you're sitting there in the lineup and you're just like studying the horizon line and you're just looking for little, like small blips to analyze. Like, is a wave going to come? Where is it going to come to? And where do I need to be to be in the best position for it? And then a skateboarder is like, always looking around trying to find a spot like oh what's like that set of stairs there or this little embankment or this curb or i could do this to this to this so you're always trying to analyze 
something that a lot of people overlook. But when you do it, you're highlighting this thing and people see some form of beauty. And I think when it's most successful, it's like not just to another skateboarder, it's pleasing, but to anybody who sees it, they can really get something interesting out of it. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. parkour is sort of like that too absolutely yeah yeah totally i mean i've never (laughs) (laughs) that's something i'm way too afraid to do but (laughs) it's amazing you know they do stuff and and you you never thought about that landscape in that context and as soon as you see someone do that it changes your perspective it broadens everything the way that you look at it what you think is possible and I think it makes everything more interesting because it gives depth to stuff that we just look at and like, oh, it's just a bench. But then all of a sudden you see someone do like a double backflip off of it and it becomes way more than that. I have to ask you about your relationship as a skater to architecture and, and to authority. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up skating in the, in the 90s when it was really cool to be we, we all thought that we were very counterculture but we didn't realize that skateboarding was extremely popular at the time uh-huh. <laughs> instead of like the jocks being the most popular people really the skateboarders were but everyone likes to pretend like they're ostracized or something like that but the reality was skateboarding was huge in the 90s but it was illegal though so we, you know we would go and anywhere you would skate you were we'd get arrested all the time and then they'd take your skateboard and your parents would have to come pick you up from the, the police department which is hilarious to think because like now they're these amazing skateboarders skateboard parks they build all over the place and we were skating stuff these like these totally derelict urban landscapes or these things that were built in the 70s that people had just abandoned so it was definitely like an outlaw thing and when i thought about architecture I always liked that idea. I wanted to try. Like I, I, I always, my dream was always to create a project that was very skatable and kind of convince a client. And I, I, I did a design a building in, in Berlin, and it has it's a very, I would say, kind of a late '90s faceted aesthetic. That's also something that came from when I came of age in architecture, and it has a, a large urban plaza. And I have yet to skate it, but I'm waiting. I would love to see a clip of someone skating it that would be like (laughs) so amazing to me that someone did some did a line through there and i would be like a crowning achievement of my life (laughs) (laughs) yes i i love that skateboarding used to be a crime and now you know this generation of architects are architecting with skateboarding in mind it's perfect (laughs) yeah it's It's a natural evolution (laughs) you can't stop trying to subvert right (laughs) So, I mean, did getting arrested for skateboarding cause friction with your parents? Were there any growing pains that you had to go through in adolescence in terms of, I don't know, finding your identity or rebelling against the status quo? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody, of course, goes through those things. And I guess there was never really anything. My parents were were always very supportive of me. And my older brother probably got in trouble more than I did, which like paved the way yes (laughs) he took the the heat for a lot of stuff and then when my parents had to pick me up from the police department then they were used to it by that time (laughs) but i guess there was kind of an unwritten rule where if i did well in school then you know i was allowed certain (laughs) missteps i guess so i thought that you know as long as i could you know perform well academically i was also on sports teams that i could do this other stuff but that was kind of i would say that to me that was like the most difficult thing with my identity was that i kind of i think i've always been someone who sought other people's approval and that kind of comes down with design too and it's an issue that you have to negotiate i think the people when i look at the most talented creative people are the ones like who are so sure of their unique vision that they can operate in a vacuum and don't care what anybody else thinks and that's kind of more like pure artistic side and I veer more towards the design because I need to work with somebody it helps me to have a context to work in and I think some of that stems from negotiating your desire to be approved by other people and be defined as something and Mm -hmm. in high school and middle school I kind of veered more towards like a jock kind of that that type of traditional high school kind of thing and I also did art classes and I had a lot of friends and I was like you know that's where I spent a lot of my free time too and I you know I didn't know what 
what part of that identity I wanted to, it couldn't really be both, right? Like it, you had to be an artist in high school or you had to be like a jock. And none of my friends who were jocks were into art and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So I spent a lot of time on one side and a lot of time on the other side. And I think that that, that kind of translated later in life where you, you kind of learned to, I mean, at first it seemed, because everything's so binary at that point, like it's a difficulty and you have to say, oh, I have to be one of the other of these. But then you realize later in life, you're like, oh, you can always kind of switch between groups. And that's not a negative, that's a positive. You know, you, you should have a diverse group of friends that you get inspiration from and that you learn things about new different, you know, whatever music or whatever they're up to. If your friend group is homogenous, then you're probably not living a very interesting life. So true. And I think one of the first skills we all learn is how to flip back and forth between those two different categories. And then the next step of that evolution is how do we integrate them both? So we're not actually Mm -hmm. switching back and forth, but we are embodying both at the same time. And there's always resistance from the outside world, right? Because they need to understand you in very basic terms. And so that complexity confuses people (laughs) so so somebody who needs approval yeah like that that confusion is is sometimes hard to navigate i totally get that like in my career it totally translated because that's (laughs) i've had my studio for six years now and i think finally i've kind of come to terms and i'm comfortable with with the diversity of work that we create but for for probably about five years i i you know i really wanted to collate the different things that I was interested in into something that was digestible to people that I could explain. And like, they say like, you know, this, the elevator pitch or something like that, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody wants you to simplify what you do so that they can digest it. And you know, know, that that's like a trait to sell yourself, I guess. And I always felt like I, I, you know, inadequate because I couldn't do that succinctly. But now I'm like, it's, it's okay. Like, you know, you don't always have to, maybe that's not so good that you could simplify yourself to one sentence or a 30 second pitch to somebody. It might mean that you actually are getting into more deeper issues that you couldn't just do that to. Right. Okay. You went to University of Maryland for undergrad. You studied architecture and then went to Pratt for your master's. But what were your college years like? Were you really studious and super focused or were you kind of like not sure about what you were doing? How did all of that come together? I decided that I wanted to study architecture. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I feel like I, I'm so, I, I had no idea like going to college where like what was a good architecture school or what was a bad architecture school. Like I said, I think I, you know, I had just basically, all I knew of architecture was that Frank Lloyd Wright was amazing and that, you know, his stuff was really cool. My mom had bought me a book that I did my like senior high school art thesis on, which was Le Corbusier and Walter Gropius and Mies van der Rohe. Mm-hmm. And so I had like read that, but I felt like I got an understanding of it, but maybe a very, very kind of trace understanding of what modernism was. But so... I went to the University of Maryland because both my parents had went there, my grandfather had gone there, and I got free tuition because my father worked for the school system. But it was not a program that I really knew very much about, and I didn't really, I don't think at that time, could have made a very intelligent decision about it. Free tuition is an intelligent decision, though. Yeah. I mean, let's just give you credit for that. (laughs) That gave you a lot of freedom later because Pratt was like the polar opposite in so many ways, economically, too. But yeah, I, I... I think I was not hyper-focused when I got there. I definitely didn't do very well my first couple semesters. I was, embarrassingly enough, in a fraternity when I was there, too, (laughs) which is, like, totally... I feel like I'm the only person in the entire New York design scene who who was or who will admit that they were. (laughs) You know, I was, like, that was kind of the culture that I had come from in high school, and and it kind of correlated to that. But So the first year and a half I spent in college, I partied way too much and I had way too much fun and I was not other than the architecture courses I was taking I wasn't super focused so I almost didn't make it into architecture school when they they do like an analysis there they did after about two and a half semesters I think and then they like decide whether you're going to be able to study architecture full-time and I wasn't admitted and it was like crushing. I I thought that surely that I would be doing this because I had signed up for it. I I had been admitted when I first applied and Mm -hmm. 
but I just, I, I think I had gotten a C in a history course and I was, I think I was supposed to write a, an essay on Burgundian Gothic churches. And for whatever reason, I didn't hand it in or I, I handed it in, but it wasn't good. <laughs> they decided like that, my performance in that class kind of knocked me out of it. So I had to go into the dean's office and beg him to let me in. <laughs> to let me in was a testament to them. I was really, I mean, I felt like I just skirted in. But once that point happened, then I like really applied myself as hard as I could. And But it was it was super frustrating because I was not good at it. I was, I really wanted to be the best student. And, and they kind of like sorted the studios out after the first project into like A students, B students, and C students. And it was really hard if you were a B student, which the vast majority of people were, to kind of break through the, to that next level. And of course, I thought I was an A student. I mean, I think like anybody probably would have thought, you know, overconfidence has definitely been a consistent throughout my life. But I was like so upset that I couldn't do as well as I wanted to. And I, I wasn't getting it. I was just focused on doing what they wanted me to do there. So for about two years, I really struggled with that. And it was like my, my last semester. I had this amazing professor, right? this guy, Gary Bowden, who he designed the a African-American Museum in Baltimore. And he, he was unique at Maryland because he came from a professional practice point of view. And a lot of the other professors there had been at Maryland for a long time and hadn't really mm -hmm. practiced all that much. So mm -hmm. he just kind of clicked with me. And at that time, I, I was so over trying really hard and not getting the results that I wanted. And I kept trying to do what I thought they wanted me to do. And at some point, I just kind of was like, fuck it. I'm just going to do whatever excites me and interests me. Mm -hmm. I did this project, and it was like a breakthrough kind of project for me personally. And Gary took notice of it, and he talked to me. And he was like, you know, he kind of gave me this pep talk. And he was like, you, you should just follow this. You can't try to do what they want you to do. You're going to have to work on your own. And this is going to be something that you're going to have to deal with for the rest of your life. So if you want to do this, you know, dedicate yourself to this side and, and like, because at that point, I was ready to just give up. I was like, this is just not for me. And because all I wanted to do was go there, you know, work, study, do exactly what they wanted to do, get an A, get a pat on the back and feel like I was an architect and I was doing the right thing. And that was a big lesson into that. That's, that's what you can't do that. Or oh, for whatever reason, I guess maybe some people that happens for some people it doesn't. But it forced me to kind of look at why I was interested in this and what I was getting out of it personally. And yeah. It's that fuck it moment. It's that f fuck it. I'm just going to do what I want to do moment. That's really crucial because when at that stage of life, when we go off to college, frequently we don't really know why we're doing it, but we know what's expected of us. And, you know, we, we, we think we know what we want to study, but we start off by breaking the rules because we have to find out like what freedom is all about. And then there's usually a moment where we have to like reconcile ourselves with like, Hey, am I doing this for other people? Am I just doing what they're telling me to do? Or am I doing this for myself? And I have to own it if I'm going to really make this path my own and, and getting to that place is so crucial. And yeah. but I don't know if you could have gotten there without having had the other pendulum swings behind you. Do you think so? Oh, de definitely not. I mean, I think, almost like a cliche that like, you know, diversity or challenges, you know, bring you to a higher level, but it's, it's so true. I mean, and I think I, I have this theory about architects specifically that, you know, they're just, every architect is, is a massive egotist. Uh huh. I just don't think that you can decide, you know, when you're 17 that you want to become an architect for any other reason that you're, you're massively egotistical because I mean, you think about what an architect does, it's like they decide what, the environment that humans live in is like mm -hmm. you're 17 years old like what could you have done to exhibit an affinity or an ability for that at that mm -hmm. point there's no way like no one nothing you could have done up to that point that would have said like oh you're actually going to be really good at this it's it's a personal decision where you have to say like you know i think i should be designing everything for everybody else you know and like you just kind of make that decision so i think when you have it when you're in that position, you're thinking like, oh yeah, I should be doing this. Like, you don't know anything about it at all. So you have to learn the hard way that you don't know and that, you know, there's a, there's a whole long 
you know, decades long career, which kind of was like, actually to me, that one of the initial things that attracted me to architecture too, though, is that I, I don't always like looked at people who, like when I was like 17 and you're thinking about what you're going to do. And I was like, I don't, what's the deal with people retiring? Like, I never understood that concept, mm. like that you would like work, you know, until you're 50 or 60 and then you re- retire and then you could do what you wanted to do. It was, like, didn't make any sense to me. I was like, well, wouldn't I choose a career that I would want to do? And then I could do that my whole life as opposed to do something I don't want to do just to get like an extra 15 or 20 years at the end of my life that I can do anything. So architects seem to be something that they, like architects worked until they died, you know, and they didn't get famous if they ever did until they were like in their fifties. So it was like, Oh, you can do this your whole life. And then if you are good at it, you get good. You don't get good or recognized for it until much later. So even if you're bad at it in the beginning, you have a long time to like practice and study it <laughs> before you get judged. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you operate. <laughs> so, so after you sort of found your way in architecture school, you started owning it for yourself. Now you've graduated and you're in a whole new landscape. What were the first few steps into the professional world like? Were they wobbly? Were they steady? Or how did you get started and what did you take away from those experiences? Well, so right after I graduated, I did a, like a study abroad in Paris and it was like, Part, still part of the program, but at that point I had technically graduated. So I I spent like a month and a half with other Maryland students living in Paris and then traveling around France seeing famous architecture. And that was the first time I ever went to Europe. And at, at that point I kind of knew that I was not going to be... I, well, I had done an internship the summer before for this firm that I will not name, but it was like the worst experience I'd ever had in my life. I sat in a cubicle and I worked on projects. Like you would work just for your lunch hour. I could like do eight hours of work in like an hour and then I could search the internet the rest of the time. So it was like, this is just, this is horrible. Like if this is what being an architect is, like I definitely don't want to do this. So I kind of had a, one of those I always think like you should have terrible experiences first because you know it's just as valuable to know what you don't want to do as it is to know what you do want to do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I had known that I was like, I don't want to go work for an architecture firm. But it wasn't until I had gone to Europe and I had seen the, you know, design is so much more integrated in, in France and a lot of other European countries than it is in the United States. So you you see really good graphic design, or at least at that time, like the early 2000s, I, was my first exposure to graphic design that was in very prosaic places. But, you know, people dedicate more attention to that there, and industrial design and all that stuff is so much more integrated into your daily life than it is here. So I was going around, and I was like seeing all this stuff, I was like, this is amazing, and there was an exhibit that I saw, I remember, at the Saltpeter Works by Ledoux outside of Paris. It was all furniture design. And I was like, this is like so cool. I would, I just got really interested in it. And I got back, my girlfriend and I were talking, and I was like, you know, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know who I want to work for. And, and she said, you should work for a furniture designer. I remember that exhibit. You were so into it. You wouldn't stop talking about it. You should, you should explore that. So I was lucky enough that in my parents' neighborhood, there was a guy who made furniture in Baltimore named David Wiesan, who makes like kind of antique furniture for interior designers. Mm-hmm. He, would, he had this shop, this really cool shop in Baltimore. And it was like, it kind of looked like a, like Indiana Jones archive. There were like these, you know, ionite column caps and cornices and statues everywhere on racks and I worked in this shop with this other guy doing like faux finishes and gold leafing Uh, of antique furniture uh (laughs) it was super cool I loved it I loved working in the shop it was so much nicer than working in the cubicle and I, I still got to design I would work with the interior designers to to like you know basically they would come in with an image that they had pulled off the internet or something like that and then we would adapt it to be more customized or combine things together and I was like you know 21 or something and uh, this was really cool and then eventually one of the interior designers hired me away from there so I went and worked for this interior designer and did you know interior design that would integrate these like classic like 
Baltimore chairs, which are like these kind of almost like Romanesque chairs, these antique type chairs and credenzas and things like that. And I would hand draft these things because this guy insisted that all of the people that work for him hand draft all of the work because he thought the clients responded better to hand drafting than to digital prints. So I was mm-hmm. doing like exploded axons, hand drafting them, and it was like <laughs> kind of cool. But at some point, it got old because like, this is stupid. Like I would, <laughs> uh, started looking around, and if you're from Baltimore, it's kind of a logical evolution to go want to move to Washington D.C. and that's where around where University of Maryland is. So there's kind of more urban density. The architecture firms are a little bit better. Not to say there are good architecture firms in Baltimore too, but. So I got a job for the this firm called Bonstra Harrison Architects, and that was like my first real solid experience in architecture. We were doing like multifamily housing buildings, but nicer condo buildings, like well thought out. And they would call it contextual modernism. That's what they did it, <laughs> which is like DC is. I don't know how much you guys know about DC's design scene, but architecturally, it's it's a heavily landmarked. Mm-hmm. city uh-huh so you can't it's very difficult so it's, it's very conservative okay that makes sense to make new things you have to always present them to the landmarks commission to the neighborhood boards it's actually great in one sense because there's a lot of oversight with what's been built and that's something that's definitely lacking in new york for instance where they've lived all those restrictions and people can kind of build whatever they want which typically is like the lowest common denominator but they're what it ended up doing was kind of forcing everybody into the same aesthetic moves. So they would have like a certain type of brick with like a certain type of asymmetrical window system that had another, like, you know, two large panels with three small operable panels. It was like this aesthetic basically ended up all veering towards the path of least resistance mm-hmm. that could get passed by everything. But then they ended up, they would call it contextual modernism because it would be in context with the historic neighborhoods that were there. Okay. Got it. As your lesson for DC. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, now I'm sure it's probably totally different because they've seen a massive boom there, but uh, at the time that was what, was what was going on. So between working for this new firm in DC and then founding your own firm, the principles, what was the path from going from one to another? From there, I, I went to Pratt and I re- I wanted like the exact opposite of what I was, had done. Maryland was like a very traditional school and we did like watercolors and clay modeling and Pratt seemed just like the total antithesis of that. It was heavily digital. We were using Maya, which is like a animation software from the movie industry to create designs and the, we learned code. So you would script, we would make algorithms that would design buildings for us. And that was like amazing to me. I got really into theory then and I was super interested in computational theory and when I finished I I was like I knew what the limitations of architecture were so I thought about maybe pursuing a PhD and becoming more of a theorist than an actual architect or not that there's a distinction Mm -hmm. but than practicing architect. So then I applied to a bunch of programs and I got into some but I went on interviews and I didn't really I was kind of nonplussed with them too but at the time I had met a girl who was interning for another professor of mine who was a, a mentor kind of to me and she's French and she was moving back to Paris and she asked me if I wanted to join her after I graduated and I was just like okay I'll move to Paris with you so I, I moved and I thought I'll give it like two or three months and see if I can get a job and uh, I ended up getting a job with this Belgian artist named Arna Quinza, and I moved to Belgium then from Paris, and then I worked for him for like four years and lived in Europe. That was like my really formative experience, I think. To, he had this amazing atelier where he would do these really large-scale urban sculptures. He had a furniture uh, company called Quinza Milan. Yeah, so it's starting to make sense now. I can see you there. Because it's got a little bit of everything that you need. <laughs> yeah, he's he was definitely a model. And unfortunately, that studio doesn't really exist how it did then. It was like, but at the time, it was it was amazing. It was like, it was so cool. And he was basically starting an architecture arm for the studio because he kept getting commissions. So I started working with that. And we had done this proposal for a, a, a really large scale urban building in Berlin. And it was this site that like, 
people have been trying to develop for a couple of decades. And it, it was a historic building that was built just after the war. So it was like kind of landmark because it was a symbol of regeneration and growth after the war. And a lot of German architects had tried to do something because it was so symbolic and it kept getting turned down by the Landmarks Commission. And we had worked with this one developer who bought the property and like, amazingly enough, we got approved. And we were like, oh, we got to, like there when you get approved for a project, you have to do it. You, you have to pay a fine if you don't go into development. So I was 28 and I had never done anything bigger than like a 20 story condo building. And I had to move to Berlin and like hire like 10 people in the, in the course of like two or three weeks and open this office. Oh my God. <laughs> um, but so I did that for, for two years. So by that time I had been working for, for him for a couple of years. And then for the last two years we're in Berlin running this office and doing this project. And it was like, it was so intense. We would work like 80 hours a week. And at that time, the recession was hitting through the United States and starting to hit through Europe, but the funding was in place for this project. So it was like, you know, it was like a 300 million euro project. It was 200,000 square meters. It was a huge project. And I'm like 28 years old, the youngest person at the table by at least 15 years, if not more. And they insisted that the language of the project be German. <laughs> And I had never spoken any German at all. So I was like learning it as I was going and just having to argue as the design architect with all these engineers. And, you know, Germans are famously conservative about detailing and architecture. So we were definitely trying to do something very experimental with the design of it. So it was just, you know, <laughs> just learning how to argue in German and what you wanted out of it. But that was an amazing experience. I mean, it was, it was uh, the project's built now and, uh, you know, it seems to be a, a pretty good success for everybody involved, but it was... Uh, this, is, this is the one you mentioned earlier that you'd love to see somebody skateboarding? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I still have yet to see it, though. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that happens for you. You work so hard. So that sounds like an incredible learning curve. How do you go from there to the principles? Well, I, I had an architect who worked for me that introduced me to Arduinos. And so this is like 2011, I think. And I was, it just blew my mind. I immediately got into it. And I, I knew how to code from learning Maya scripting at Pratt. So I immediately took to it. It was the same language, C+. It just, I don't know, all the things that were wrong with the process of doing this large building, which were, you know, we had total design freedom, but we couldn't prototype in a way that I thought was leading towards a positive end game. Mm. You know, you would invest a lot, but you wouldn't see the result for like years. And I really wanted to integrate these things and work on them in a more real-time basis. And this seemed like just such an immediate way to get a reaction and tr try to integrate how people experience space in a real-time way. And I had a friend who had a gallery in Berlin, and he asked me if I wanted to do an installation. And I did one that was all based of, off of Arduino, and that was like my first thing. I just was blown away, but I was like, I have to pursue this. So I just kind of started doing small projects. I, I, I did like a workshop in, in Milan at the Polytechnico. And then I was going to do something at this design fair in Berlin and it involved some a kind of a large laser cut panel. And I was talking to Chaz Constantine, who was my old partner. And, you know, we had grown up together and we had, he'd gone to Prada around the same time as me. And we were G chatting. I was like, I can't find anybody in Berlin to make these parts for me. And, and he was working heading a metal shop at that time and he was like why don't you send me the files we can make them here so we started kind of collaborating on that i was like i have to fly to new york for work anyway maybe we could make it and i could fly back with it so i flew over and me him and then chris williams who is the other original founding member of the principals made this piece from basically 8 p.m when their shop closed and their boss left until 6 a.m the next morning boxed it up i took it in a cab and then flew like took it immediately to the airport and flew back with it and assembled it and we knew immediately we were like we got to do something together like this is such a great combination of all three of us so 
probably about within three months, I think I had moved back and we had started the studio. So what is the combination of all three of you? You're an architect and the other two are... Chaz, he's an industrial designer. And then Chris was a master metal fabricator. He'd been making stuff his whole life and he knew how to put things together. Yeah. We were in this realm where you couldn't just ask somebody. A lot of the stuff that we were doing hadn't really been done in that exact way before. So we could kind of cover all the basis between that. And it was pretty amazing. I mean, especially when you're starting out your studio and you're young, no one really knows who you are. So you have to make a lot of opportunities for yourself. You fabricate them out of nowhere. And we had the means and abilities to do that stuff. So we had this, we just got this big space in Greenpoint and we were like, let's just start making projects. And we kind of, we had done the very first project we had done was a student workshop where we made this large interactive canopy. And at that time there really weren't a lot of interactive design elements in architecture programs or I mean now they're full programs like ITP you know at NYU is totally based on that but in a kind of a different focus but you know at that time I, I kind of felt like there was a, a responsibility to be able to teach students who ha didn't have any exposure but were interested in it mm -hmm. and then at the same time they got to build this thing and then we would get to build it and you know these things kind of come to fruition. So it was just a really great you know, combination of all of our skill sets and allowed us to do stuff that were way beyond what our level was at that time. Give us a sense of the trajectory of the studio because you've been working as the principals for how long now? For six years. And a lot of that work is installations that are designed for interactivity. They're experimental in nature. They're frequently... Not the kind of thing you can just go to an established vendor and say, build me this. <laughs> you got you got to figure it out, right? Yeah, yeah. Everything, I mean, you have to, everything from like, you know, the concept to the mechanics of it and then the system that you're going to execute it within. So a lot of times we are designing a custom structural system that, you know, is totally integrated with what the digitized or the robotic aspect or the architectural aspect of the pieces too. The three main projects that we do are experimental projects, which then elements of those then filter or evolve into product design. Because once you do mm -hmm. enough of those things, you kind of get things out of that and then you can crystallize elements of those into product design and then also into architectural design. Because those are two realms where it's a little bit more difficult to be extremely experimental because you have to rely on precedent. You have to do things that are a little bit more functional and you can't take as many risks. But by doing a series of the experimental projects and, and allowing a system or a concept to develop over time, then eventually you can integrate it into those projects too. Yeah, I can see that. It's so much harder. You know, when you're designing a restaurant, there's a lot of fundamentally basic things including fire safety code and building code that you have to worry about so you can't just say oh like you know we should put a robotic wall here that <laughs> shifts this thing yeah <laughs> or you can't just say let's redesign the way people eat like let's do a, a fork that's really a glove and teach everyone to eat with their hands um <laughs> but you can if it's only up for you know, a week or whatever, right. <laughs> because if it's massive failure, then, you know, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> right. They come also with their experimental hat on. So that makes for a different interaction. So your creative process, I'm kind of curious. I mean, your projects are also different and they all involve a high level of like inventorship at the very front end. Have you distilled out anything about yourself that is like, the beginning point i love geometry and i love to like to find and, and create systems and i think that that's well I, i've noticed that that's like the underlying basis of all of my work because if you don't have a good system a structural system or you know some type of organic system below that then the rest of the elements won't function very well or that's a good starting point i guess you know you can say like oh i want to create a space that when you breathe in, like the walls expand and then when you exhale, they come in and you can start with that concept, but it's then you're not going to like go from there then to the robotics and then to the structure. You still need to you start with what's like, you know, what exactly is all this made of and how can that function at the base level that can then facilitate this level of movement or interactivity. So I definitely am very, 
interested in just starting with abstract systems all the time. Mm -hmm. And is that the kind of thing that your brain ruminates on <laughs> for fun? <laughs> on, on, a, <laughs> on a daily basis, or just sitting like, you know, to me, being an architect is like a 24 hour job. It's like that, that was the other part too, is like, you know, just being alive, you're learning about the built environment. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, that much free, more free time or studying, you know, you're always, anything you do, you're learning about stuff. And I think the point is just to make sure that you're feeding yourself varied and interesting stuff. So it doesn't matter. I, I will get inspiration from reading a book or from, you know, skateboarding or surfing or whatever. It's just an experience. And I think it's more of a state of mind for me, at least when I, when I get to a point, I definitely have like an aha moment or a eureka moment where I know what the path is and I can't force myself into it. You have to let the idea bake a little bit before it can come out of the oven. Yeah. But those aha moments, those eureka moments are like the drug. That's <laughs> why we keep doing this because for that fix, man, <laughs> it's so good. You know, you're it's sitting so there good. and you're like, how am I going to do this? Like, there's no way. And then you know, just you're reading a book, and then all of a sudden you're like, "Oh, I did this." That was like, "Oh, that's like I gotta go right there." You, know, you just like run in yeah. and just start doing it. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it's so it's so fun. So, when you're designing these structures or spaces for interactivity, what are you aiming to achieve, and what are you thinking about as you're ideating these or executing these? I guess maybe the best way to answer that might be to give us an example. Sure, everyone's definitely unique, and I mean, in general, for me, the point, you know, which I think is so important for every designer to always, as frequently as possible, take a step back and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. you know, what's the point? <laughs> Could someone else do it better? Am I actually achieving something with all this effort? And for me, it always comes back to the idea that you know, if, if I can do something that can show people something that exists around them, but they're overlooking so something like that in a new way that can expand how they see the world and that they can take a little bit more time in, and be more patient in what they see and, and get more meaning with all the stuff that's around them. I think that then I can, I'm doing something good with the designs that I'm doing. So when I talk about interaction or when I make spaces that are, that are interactive, it's definitely about trying to correlate between the subjective human architecture our bodies like this you know like we're all these individual pieces of architecture that are programmed to give us like we're the center of the universe but we're aware of the fact that there's a whole world outside of us and that we have to correspond to it so the work that i do is to try to mediate between those two things especially the biometric work so like we did a project for ford like four years ago. And it was a very simple concept. It was creating like a individual pod that people would walk into. And the idea was to try to unite the individual architecture of our bodies with the collective architecture that was surrounding us. So the way that we do it is kind of think about what's the sequence that the people are going to experience as they go into this space. And like, how can I mentally separate somebody from that? So in this case, we we're looking at like a tight kind of compressed canyon like space that someone will walk into. And as they were getting more constricted, that might redirect their focus mm -hmm. at that point. And then it opens up. So then when it opens up, they're kind of in a mirrored space on the floor and the ceiling. It's, it's a it's the concept of the idea is to like decontextualize you from your standard environment so that you're free to kind of open your mind as to what to expect. You're not coming up with any preconceived notions about what should be happening mm -hmm. there. And at the center was a, a, a pulse sensor, like a little like fingertip pulse sensor like they use in hospitals. And you put your finger in it and you kind of calm yourself and start to breathe. And then the walls begin to emanate with your heartbeat. What? And it's a simple like concept, like the way that it works all together, but like, you know, that you would experience space in that way and you would be so intimately linked with it was actually pretty effective with how people responded. That was really cool. I experienced that exhibition and it was really awesome. You're like the built world tangible version of a psychedelic drug. Have, in the way that, yeah, in the way that you're like helping people see beyond their natural perspective and 
how they're interconnected with everything around them. Have you done drugs? Let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> uh, in high school, we did a lot of acid. Okay. Oh, the <laughs> 90s. <laughs> yeah, I was very into that. I haven't since I was like 21. I don't, it's weird because it's kind of come back into fashion and people microdose a lot now, but I, I kind of overdid it, I think, to the extent that I don't know if I could I could deal with it. But Absolutely. You know, when you're at that age, like 16 or 15 years old, we were really into the doors. Mm -hmm. I was reading Aldous Huxley, like Ken Kesey, like that type of stuff. And you're searching for meaning and, you know, you're not, you're not satisfied with what you see around you. So you're trying to look for layers of meaning beyond what is just apparent. And that was one way to really, really experience reality in a unique way. I mean, I think the time in your life also applies and being a teenager with very very few responsibilities and not a lot yeah in already. <laughs> yeah <laughs> totally <laughs> totally well I was gonna ask you what is all for anyway but you've already answered that in terms of like you know your your big purpose is to help people expand their perspective in terms of how they relate to the world around them. So then my next question for you is, do you ever get stuck in that purpose? Or when things get complicated or stressful, like, how do you personally get yourself unstuck? Mm. Well, you know, that's what, like, the architectural projects or the product design stuff is for, because there's a lot of pragmatics and how do you get something like that built? And that's like a boring aspect, but there's an artistry to it, too. So if you're, if you're too deep and <laughs> you're like lost in this sea of meaning and it's very easy to get lost in that, then you also have to say, well, how do I bring this back to reality so someone can actually experience it? And that means, well, how is this going to be fabricated? What's this going to be made of? What type of hardware do I need to use for this? What's the structure going to be for, to stand up? And those are things that I think are really like the tectonics, mm -hmm. I guess, of the mm -hmm. project. I, re I like to get lost in it as well because that helps, you know, like, you, know you could sit there and you know, just have to figure out how this is going to be built and not have to worry about... Because that, that's the that's thing with architecture, too. It needs to stand on all of those fronts. You can't do something that has these broad, beautiful, but and meaningful, like, strokes as far as perspective and how people experience the world. But then if you have a, an ugly connection or an inelegant structure to it, people are going to focus yeah. on that. So... You have to think like you don't want people to know this mm -hmm. stuff, you know. If no one notices or said anything about it, you probably did a really good job because they're focused on the concept and not on how it was built or the mistakes you may have made. So that's a good way to redirect your energies. And I think you're always kind of doing that because you can't run super far and only exist in one realm. Otherwise, you, I think if you were in that realm, you'd find it very difficult to like pull yourself back into the day to day mm -hmm. life. I I think my question would be like, do you have any personal goals that are, like, are aside from your professional goals? Like, do you want to travel somewhere exotic or do you have a, a, a life goal or maybe a more immediate goal for yourself? Well, I'm expecting a child in September. Congratulations! Uh, my wife and I are, are going to have a kid, so... Definitely. Well, that's a big one. <laughs> I heard about that. And, uh, you know, that, that adds a whole level of dimension that adds so much more meaning to what's happening and gives you a great perspective mm. to not get too focused on certain elements and to tr try to think about just what are the dynamics between me and my wife. And well, both of us, you know, my wife is a fashion designer and she has her own label. And as people who run our businesses ourselves and kind of exist in that realm, that's that's a huge part of our life that's constantly always happening and we're always talking about each other's work and collaborating a lot too. Tell, tell us your wife's name and her label. My wife's name is Yara Flynn and her label is Nomia. I mean, it's amazing. I love that we have that together, the positive impact we've had on each other's careers, but it, it, more than anything, it's given us perspective mm. to not take them too seriously and to take our interaction with each other and our family and that's the biggest nucleus and how you maintain that so that you can continually have meaning that's like your primary source of meaning that and if you're really enjoying that then your work will most obviously be good because you're going to feel good you can't sacrifice mm. one to the benefit of the other it's true yeah they both feed each other and it's i mean it's like there's endless ups and downs when you're working at at our scale or you know 
we both have kind of organized our careers to have as much freedom as possible. And when you have as much freedom as possible, you're kind of always on the precipice of failure. <laughs> <laughs> we support each other a lot and, and you'll have an amazing six months or a great year and then you'll have a terrible year. And, you know, we having each other and that puts it into so much better perspective where I think earlier in my career, I was so focused on getting it right. And like, I have to consistently always be succeeding in creating work that's getting the response that I want out of it. And having, you know, had all those ups and downs throughout my career and gotten to a point where I was kind of finally comfortable with that and comfortable with what the result of, of what mm -hmm. I want to do is going to be like for the rest of my mm -hmm. life and for her too, you realize that it's, it's all about the relationships that are correlating that, not about, you know, oh, at this, I'm going to get to this level, then it's going to do this project, then finally I'm going to do this project. <laughs> and then that yeah. project is going to make me happy or whatever you're like no that's not how it works like it's it's a journey is you you have to be enjoying it at all phases because if you're waiting for it to end to feel satisfied then you're not going to get anything out of it agree if only yeah if only you had helped me figure that out a long time ago <laughs> and you'll and you'll forget it too like you can realize yeah. it and then you know you totally start operating without that knowledge you have to keep reminding yourself of it <laughs> yes. So you also mentioned that being an architect means you may never need to retire. But is there a long term goal for the principles? Yeah, for me, always, it's been to integrate this experimental work into the built environment in as many permanent forms as possible. And that for me is a, a, something that's a long term goal that that it's just actually for me is so exciting because it's finally starting to happen in ways I can I'm starting to finally get some more permanent projects out there and integrate elements of, of this like heavily experimental studio and just the first inklings of it, mm -hmm. you know, the next decade or two, I would love to be able to just continue that and do that over, you know, a long period of time. Like I think Fry Auto is for instance, somebody who was to, like, he's a structural engineer and did lightweight structures, but you know, he was just always experimenting and always going from, this model level to to kind of installation level to large scale building and he only had a handful of really large scale projects that were built throughout his life mm -hmm. that he got those alone was like a f enormous feat and it was a testament to his commitment to continually experimenting and pushing things and and their impact is felt so i think that for me, even if it only results in, I mean, I kind of had this weird inversion where like one of the first things I ever did was this very large project, but it was a, like this massive kind of learning experience. So I think what I would really like to have is just, I'm fine if it's only a couple more of those, but there's been thousands of experiments in between that have fed to them. Yeah. All right. I, I like that this is an open-ended goal and not like, oh, I'm just going to check this box and be done. It's just, it, it feels very ongoing and fluid and flexible and exciting. Let's check in in like 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. We'll call you back in 10 years. In 10 years, that's when your, your current child is going to be skateboarding on whatever ah. your, your tangible built world is structures are <laughs> I don't even consider that oh man you just like up the expectations <laughs> okay so let's talk about a current or recent project that you might want to plug so our listeners can can check it out or learn about it I, I just finished this project for thinks that was a temporary installation but I, I just got the photos back and I'm really excited about them so it hasn't like been published anywhere yet but it was, I, I, I really like that company. They make period underwear for women. Mm -hmm. And I just like that they're bringing these things that were kind of pushed to the side into the conversation. You know, women's cycles and stuff, they're talking about them openly. So I really support that company. And they came out with this new product that's a sex blanket for people to have sex on top of when women have their period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they asked me to do an installation that would help them promote this project. And so I designed a space that was about, it's kind of this series of arcing and curving walls made from these corrugated screens. And the idea was to create a space that would 
drive people together to become more intimate with each other and their environment as they pass through it and have different zones of activity within it. Uh, and that, that was kind of conceptually correlating to the, the sex blanket, which was about levels of intimacy with each other during new experiences, but also with this product itself. And it was just a really fun project to do. And there's such a great team. And so I'm very proud and excited about that result. Then I have another project, a sculpture in the Bronx that's opening that's in a, a park called Starlight Park. It's this really cool park that's was initially the site of this failed attempt at a World's Fair. So in like the 1910s or something like that, this guy decided he wanted to have a World's Fair. And he chose this site in the Bronx because it was right near the threshold between Westchester County and the city limit. So he thought he would get a lot of people from those two areas there. And he built up this huge structure and he applied to the World's Fair committee and was turned down. And he decided that he was just going to have the World's Fair anyway, but you can't call it that. It had to be called an exposition. <laughs> Lo and behold, World War One hit. And every country that he asked to apply to was like, no, no, we're not going to, we're, there's a world war going on. So the only country that was partaking in it was Brazil. And it was kind of a massive failure, but the sight of it then turned into this amusement park that was there for many years. And there was a roller coaster and there was like the city's biggest saltwater pool that had a big beach and all these diving things. I've been working with the Bronx River Art Center who had a competition for a series of artists to make large public sculptures in this park that were inspired by this history. So I collaborated with this other artist named Gabriela Salazar to design uh, this structure that's reminiscent of the roller coaster that was there. And it's made out of all faceted Corten steel and it has mm -hmm. plants that go around and it's in this infinity loop and it kind of creates different zones for people to sit in. So you can have levels of like intimate interaction and then more kind of public zones. And that was just completed. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And that'll be up for the next year. Oh, cool. Bronx. Okay. So where can our listeners see both of these projects on the web and on social media and keep tabs on your work? The, neither of them are up yet because I, I just got images, but they can go to my website at theprinciples.us and then follow us on Instagram at... T H E underscore principles, so P R I N C I P A L S. And then I think my you can follow me. My my personal account too is Drusa Skunis on Instagram too. If you want to <laughs> see pictures of my cats and yeah, and your baby, yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been really awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. Thank you for asking me to be on it. It's, it's such a pleasure to talk about yourself <laughs> for an hour. Well, you gave us good stuff. And thanks for being candid about things like, you know, fucking up in college and doing drugs. Oh, it happens, right? You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's. I think those are important milestones in, in growth and evolution. Yeah, I agree. Good luck with your baby. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations, Congratulations for real. We'll talk to you again thanks soon. Thanks a lot. Yeah, looking forward to it. Take care, guys. I uh, So a couple of things I'm taking out of this conversation. Number one, I like that he, at a young age, thought, why do people work and then get 15 years to like do whatever they want? Like, why can't they do that from the beginning or find a career they like that integrates with their life that they could do till they die? And I thought mm -hmm. that was a really interesting concept too. And maybe a lot of people don't get there until they're in their 30s or 40s or something but he's thinking about this you know in college or before college so I thought that was very wise of him and then of course he identified something right away which was really awesome too and then the other takeaway I have from this is that oh no I forgot <laughs> Amy should I write it down <laughs> hold on, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> no no, I didn't write it down. Holy shit. Did it come from his youth, his adolescence, or yeah, his adulthood? Yeah, keep telling me. Oh, what the fuck was I talking about? I don't remember. Oh, it's such a Monday. Yeah. It's like the Mondayest of Mondays today. One of the things I took away from this conversation was to 
really look at things with different perspective because when we were talking about like surfing and skating and then about looking at an environment differently Mm -hmm. sometimes you need somebody to intervene right you're not just going to walk upon something and be like oh that's a different thing like he's doing that he's that intervention that says like hey you need to look at this in a different way. He's the parkour person who's hopping and doing backflips off of the bench. And then all of a sudden you have this like epiphany of like, oh, you know, it's a bench that serves a functional purpose, but hey, it could also be this other thing. And then your gears start turning. And I love that he's facilitating that for people. Exactly. And I mean, in dedicating your life to helping create these experimental environments that also help other people think about the built world differently. He's, I can only imagine how many other like sort of channels of creativity he's opened up for people. I mean, it's one thing to talk about him doing this work, but it's another thing to think about how many people are influenced by this and how they might go on to influence the built world. Like that ripple effect must be enormous. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he's kind of like trying to be the Frank Lloyd Wright documentary where he's like (laughs) all of a sudden influencing all these people to become (laughs) architects, but not necessarily become architects, but just maybe something like influencing them in some way or inspiring them in some way to do something or look at something differently or treat people a different way or have empathy or uh, any of those things. I mean, it's all baked in, right? Mm -hmm. Expanding your preconceived notions of something always leads to reducing your prejudice in the world. Also, can we just give a shout out to High Quality Design Media? Thank you, PBS, for that documentary on Frank Lloyd Wright. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) Um, Yeah, well, there was something else I wanted to mention, but now I can't think about what it was, and I didn't write it down. I was doodling. Did it have to do with his time in Berlin when he had to build that that giant no building no i'll probably remember it like at midnight or something i kind of enjoyed his his brief stint working for the furniture maker where he was like gold leafing things the bespoke stuff in maryland yeah but it was also the first time we got a sense of him like working hands-on and really connecting all the stuff he was thinking about in his brain to like the physical world Mm -hmm. and I love that he described it as what did he describe it as like Indiana Jones's warehouse (laughs) (laughs) I can totally see it you could also tell that he sort of he started to feel the promise of being able to realize projects out into the world just through his hands in that right. in that summer or whenever he was working and that's that empowering person. and mm-hmm. it boosts your confidence and stuff like that Mm-hmm. i now remember go for it okay <laughs> the second takeaway i have from this conversation is that a lot of times in your youth or early career you like are on this path to just check off boxes like oh i'm gonna go to college and i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna you know, get a job and have a family or blah, 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 like all the things. And you you put yourself in these weird silos, like kind of like you do when you're in high school and you're like, I'm a jock or I'm an artist or what, you know, those kinds mm-hmm. of things. But there comes a point in your life where you have that fuck it moment, which he had. And mm-hmm. I think that's really interesting because he did have it at a young age. And I think that's awesome for him. Not everybody has that experience. But also, I think it's really important advice for people like life advice and business advice is that like you don't always like your idea of something, whether it's a career or whatever, like it can be multifaceted. It can be fluid. It can be emotional. It doesn't have to be like your idea of what an architect should be or your idea of what an attorney or an accountant or whatever a doctor does all day long. In fact, it shouldn't be because you have to own it if you're going to inject it with any sort of purity of intention and authenticity of of thought and motive, you know? Yeah, I, I just feel like people sometimes do that because they do want a universal way to digest something like he said like understanding some what somebody does really easily through like a very short elevator pitch right but i think that squishes curiosity 
curiosity not only for the person who you're talking to and them wanting to know more about what you do and you actually having the ability to talk to them about what mm-hmm. you do and explain it and, and have that conversation, but also for yourself. Like if you know already what, you know, what this particular career is going to entail, like where's the curiosity of for yourself to like expand your mind, like be creative and come up with right. creative solutions for things. If you're just like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. I think you're absolutely right. And I think squishing curiosity, A, is bad for your health, bad for your fulfillment, and B, a recipe for a midlife crisis of epic proportions. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You're basically like setting yourself up to have like a freak out. Yeah. (laughs) Like, is this all there is? This can't be all there is. (laughs) What am I doing with my life? Oh my God. (laughs) Well, it sounds like he's he's not on the road to a midlife crisis. He and his wife do seem like they are embracing the dance. It is a very stressful and precarious to both be sort of running your own brands and businesses where it's feast or famine. It's kind of all hinging on your own ability to generate new ideas, but it's also you feel it very directly if the clients aren't beating down your door or if a project doesn't perform as you hoped it would. It's a direct hit to your livelihood and to your your personal morale and esteem. And so they're both doing that. And the fact that he recognizes that that is what's most important and what is ultimately going to feed both of their professions and their creative fulfillment is very wise indeed. I tell you what, though, that baby's going to be the most experimental project yet. (laughs) Oh, my God. I can't wait to see what he comes up with after he has a kid. And then all that other like weird relationship, emotional stuff comes out and he has to process all of it. I'm stoked. Thanks for listening, you guys. Please go to cleverpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter, read the show notes and see images of Drew's work. You can subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or the provider of your choice. And please remember to subscribe, rate, and review. That really, really helps us get discovered by new listeners and share these amazing stories with more people. You can always connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast. Tell us what you think. Share your stories. We love hearing from you. Clever is produced by 2VDE Media. This episode was edited by Ty Navaris and Alex Perez with music by L1011.